Today's lecture is on the topic of ethics. Anthropological ethics are rooted in the responsibilities that anthropologists have to four things. To those that we study, to scholarship and science, to the public, and to students and trainees. Let's take each of these separately, starting with our responsibility to those that we study. There are five key concerns here. First, our primary concern must be the welfare of those we work with. Second, do no harm. Third, give anonymity and recognition. Fourth, informed consent. And fifth, be transparent. And again, I'll take each of these separately, um, and we'll talk about each one. Anthropological researchers have their primary ethical obligations to the people, species, and material they study, and to the people with whom they work. Anthropology is, in essence, a, a parasitic field. We get more from the people we study than we give to them. If you think about it, um, why do people in India spend their time with me? Why do they take time out of their busy day to, to spend time with me um, so that I can get the material for a book? We rely on the kindness of strangers. And because of that, it is absolutely imperative that we do everything we can to make sure that these strangers who become our friends and our informants and, our, uh, and the people that we learn from are protected in the course of the work that we do with them. What is very important to recognize is that this obligation to, to take care of the people we study supersedes our, obligation to, our obligations to science and to the truth and to seeking new information. When I was a journalist, my ethical practices were quite different than when I was an anthropologist. My primary ethical obligation was to the story, not to the people I was reporting about. And it did not matter if those people got hurt as long as I was telling the truth. I remember one time I had a fellow reporter who came in to the lounge and threw himself down on the couch and said, I don't know why these people talk to me. I wouldn't talk to me. So of course we all had to get the story from him and it turned out that what he had been doing is interviewing a guy who was suing a big government agency. And he liked a guy, he was the kind of reporter who liked to report about underdogs fighting big government, and he really liked the guy, and the guy had sensed that the reporter liked him, and so he started to say more than he should have. And he said a few things that, at least on the surface, contradicted the affidavit he'd filed in his lawsuit. And the reason the reporter was upset is that although he really liked this guy, he knew that that was what he was going to lead his story with, because that's what his ethical obligations led him to. I've seen a lot of people hurt by reporters in my years as a journalist, and I have to say, I like being an anthropologist better. Uh, the second issue is do no harm. This is the part of the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Look out for your informant's safety, look out for their dignity, and look out for their privacy. Number three, give anonymity and recognition. Anthropological researchers have to determine in advance whether their hosts wish to remain anonymous or wish to receive recognition, and they have to make every effort to comply with those, uh, with those desires. This leads us to the issue of informed consent. Uh, anthropological researchers should obtain in advance the informed consent of the people that, who are being studied. Uh, or providing information, or who own or control access to the areas studied, or uh, anyone else who might be um, identified as having interests that are impacted by the research. Informed consent can be a written document, but if there's reason to believe that what you're doing is sensitive and that a written document with someone's name on it might get them in trouble, then uh, you might want to have instead uh, an oral informed consent, and I've done that many times. Um, in my research. Informed consent is also necessary if you're going to use photographs. This cartoon captures uh, the essence of this um, and how difficult it is. Um, sometimes it seems very banal or uh, even sounds foolish to be asking people, you know, can I please get a release to use this information? Uh, can you please sign this and let me know if you want to be anonymous or if you want me to use your real name? 
It's very different from when I was a journalist, um, but it's very important. Getting and giving recognition can be really, really tricky. The first time I went to India and I was doing this study on political journalism, a lot of the journalists and even a lot of the newspaper readers did not want their names used. They wanted to be identified by code names or, or not identified at all. And so I had built a lot of anonymity into my project, so much so that everyone was automatically anonymous. Well, this didn't set well with a couple of journalists who felt that they were already public figures who commented critically in politics, and they wanted their names to be known because for them, being mentioned in a study was extra social capital that went towards their, their professional credentials. So the next time that I did my research uh, with urban professionals, I made a very complex kind of document that allowed everyone to either opt for anonymity or to opt out. It was automatically anonymous unless you filled out a document that allowed you to be name, uh, mentioned by name. And if you read my book, Connected in Cairo, or the current book I'm working on in India, um, I'm very careful to give pseudonyms to the people who didn't sign a document, but I use real names for the people who did. The last point is about transparency. When we go into our fieldwork experiences, we build up very real relationships with other people, up to and including uh, anthropologists who marry into the community of their own uh, that they're studying in. When this happens, anthropologists have to be very, very careful that everything is transparent and above board about what counts as when they're gathering information and what is um, excluded and is so personal that there's a promise it will not be uh, shared. P there must be no sense ever that the anthropologist is manipulating anyone as they are gathering data. Anthropologists can gain personally from their work, but they must never exploit individuals or groups, uh, animals, um, or for that matter the cultural or biological materials that they collect. Anthropologists need to always recognize that they have a debt to the societies in which they work and that they have an obligation to reciprocate with the people studied in appropriate ways. I am always humbled by the generosity of the people who allow me to enter into their homes, into their workplaces, into their everyday lives, into their professional activities, uh, to study them, um, about whom I write, and whose giving of their time and energy to me has enabled me to build a career as an anthropologist. And I can never give back as much as I have gotten from these people. I do what I can. Um, one of the things that I've done every time I've gone to India, for example, is I've taught workshops on journalistic writing, um, bringing skills that I developed during my time as a political journalist in Washington, D.C., to help young reporters, uh, particularly at the Time School of Journalism. Uh, there was another uh, small school of journalism um, that one of my informants ran, uh, where I also gave workshops. You do what you can but you will never give back as much as you get from the communities you study, and that's a very humbling aspect of being an anthropologist. Okay, our second obligation is our, oblig is our responsibility to science and scholarship. And again, there are five key points. As ethical anthropologists, we are expected to anticipate ethical issues, to engage in honest scholarship, to preserve the sites in which we work, to share our results, and to share our data. Let's take each of these separately again. First, anthropologists are expected to anticipate ethical issues. We're supposed to plan ahead. We know that we will encounter ethical dilemmas. It's almost inevitable at every stage of the work. And so we need to make a good faith effort to identify potential ethical claims and conflicts in advance when we're preparing our proposals and when we are beginning our project so that when these issues arise, we have a plan in place for how to deal with them. One of the ways that we do this is through a mandatory process that anyone who gets government funding has to go through, which is called an Institutional Review Board. This is a committee that's been formally designated to approve and monitor and review biomedical and behavioral research that involves human subjects. 
what the review board does is it asks for a copy of our research proposal and then it asks us to identify all of the ethical dilemmas that we can see arising and then it asks us to uh, discuss how we would deal with those dilemmas if they arise. And then this, uh, is re this proposal that we write is reviewed by a number of researchers who have experience doing research, have encountered these kinds of obstacles in the past, and can think critically about whether you've really imagined everything that could go wrong and if your, the, your plans for dealing with these ethical dilemmas are actually, being, uh, are actually practical uh, and can be put into place. The next one is to engage in honest scholarship. Anthropological researchers are subject to the same moral rules of scientific and scholarly conduct as other kinds of scientists. They shouldn't uh, deceive anyone. They shouldn't knowingly misrepresent uh, what they're doing. Um, they shouldn't uh, misreport. They shouldn't fail to report misconduct that they see, and they shouldn't obstruct the scientific scholarly research of other people. And this cartoon just um, captures one of these dilemmas uh, that occasionally pops up. Another dilemma is the um, importance of preserving the sites where we work. Anthropological researchers should do all they can to preserve opportunities for future field workers to follow them into the field. I'll just give you two interesting examples of that, both from um, faculty that I had at Brown University um, in my PhD work. One of the faculty members was an underwater archaeologist, and he would go into underwater sites, and he would carefully photograph them. Uh, there would be sonar. Occasionally, they would excavate and bring things up to the surface. Um, they might take pieces of it for study, and then they would go put it back. The idea was to leave the site as intact as possible so that future researchers who might have even better equipment would be in a good place to come back to the site and learn more from it uh, in the future. Indiana Jones is um, a beautiful example of the opposite case. Uh, Indiana Jones manages to destroy almost every archaeological site that he goes into. So he goes into a, uh, uh, an ancient temple, and when he's finished, uh, he's got uh, you know, maybe he's retrieved a golden artifact, but that's all we've got left. The whole temple is in ruins, uh, and nobody can come along uh, and study it uh, at any time in the future. Another obligation is to share your results. Anthropological researchers are supposed to share the results of their work in an appropriate fashion, and whenever possible to disseminate their findings to the scientific and scholarly community. This is usually done in the form of book chapters and papers, uh, and what you're seeing popping up on the screen are just examples of some of the books and papers that I've published over the years from my work in Egypt and India. Sharing in, uh, your results is one thing. Sharing your data is something that anthropologists are increasingly being asked to do. Anthropological researchers are requested to seriously consider any requests that others have to look at their raw data. They are therefore supposed to make every effort to ensure that their fieldwork data is preserved so that both people in the present and people in the future will be able to make use of that data. And here we have uh, a picture of um, some people going over the long-lost works of one of Australia's leading early anthropologists. And uh, having recovered this data, they're now carefully exploring it. We have an archaeologist here in our department uh, who's recently been looking at data from uh, a Mesoamerican archaeologist um, of the 1930s uh, whose work has all been carefully archived at the university where he used to uh, teach. The next key responsibility of anthropologists is our responsibility to the public. And this has only two codicils in the uh, anthropological ethics statement. The first is um, the requirement to make our results available to the public, and the second is the permission to use our information for advocacy. So let's begin by discussing uh, what is sometimes called public scholarship. Anthropological researchers are supposed to make the results of their research available to their sponsors, to students, to decision makers, 
uh, and to non-anthropologists wherever it's appropriate. If I decide to publish a popular book, like the ones pictured here, um, based on my data, um, there are certain ethical requirements. The first is I need to be truthful. Even though I may be trying to persuade the public of something, I need to make sure that I am truthful in terms of both the factual content of what I'm writing, but also in uh, articulating the social and political implications of the information that I am publishing. Second, I need to ensure that my findings are properly contextualized and responsibly utilized. And this is a very difficult task. It's easier if you write the text. It's very difficult when you talk to people in the media, because the media often distorts data simply in the process of trying to make it a good story. Right? An example is that a lot of data that goes before the media is essentially a kind of statistical prediction. And the media present it as having far more cogency than it actually has. Along the same lines, one of the things that's very important when you are trying to do public, uh, when you're trying to do public scholarship is to make clear the empirical basis of your findings. How do you know what you know? This is often covered up in shorter accounts, but we put this data into our, into our uh, scholarly papers, and we should also put it into our public work. Fourth, be candid about qualifications and philosophical and political biases. What are my credentials on the basis of which I speak? Are there particular biases I have that the audience should know to help them interpret my data? Fifth, make clear the limits of anthropological expertise. Anthropologists work from microdata, but we also do broad comparative work. And both of these give us a certain kind of provenance to speak. What we don't have is uh, authority to speak on certain kinds of issues outside that provenient. And finally, and this comes back to the first point that we made, do no harm to people with whom you work. And that comes up again and again. Anything you publish, you have to consider, is there any way this could bring harm, even psychological harm, even embarrassment or humiliation? You have no right to bring that kind of risk to the people who allowed you to study amongst them. That said, if you fulfill those um, requirements, you have a right to advocate. You have a right to be called as an expert witness, to testify before Congress on, uh, in areas of your expertise, um, and to try to use your knowledge of the world uh, to make the world a better place um, through policy, through law, through the court system. Finally, Anthropologists have a responsibility to students and trainees, to the people we teach. First, uh, we must not discriminate. Second, we have an obligation to be a good teacher. Third, we have an obligation to teach ethics. Fourth, we have an obligation to give credit where credit is due. And fifth, no sex. Let's take each of these separately. First of all, as teachers and mentors, anthropologists need to conduct their programs in ways that preclude any kind of discrimination on the basis of sex, marital status, race, social class, political convictions, disability, religion, ethnic background, national origin, sexual orientation, age, or any other criteria that's irrelevant to academic performance. Academic performance is the only grounds on which we can discriminate, and we do it by giving people A's, B's, C's, D's, or F's uh, within the university's grading system. Second, we have obligations to be good teachers, and some of those obligations are spelled out. Um, teachers and mentors have specific duties that they should be engaged in. They should be continually trying to improve their teaching techniques. They should be available and responsive to student interests. They should counsel students realistically regarding their career opportunities. They should conscientiously supervise, encourage, and support students. They should be fair and prompt and reliable in communicating evaluations, that is, grades or assessments of student work. They should assist students in securing research support when students want to do independent research, and they should help students 
when they seek professional placement. Before I go on, I just want to say that uh, I work with a great faculty in the anthropology department here at Miami, and I think that every faculty member I work with, to some extent, follows uh, all of these. And um, I'm really proud to have them, and I think we have a great program because of it. Now, one of these obligations is that we need to teach ethics in our classroom. Teachers and mentors are supposed to impress upon our students the ethical challenges involved in every phase of anthropological work, and that is, in fact, what uh, I'm trying to do today with this lesson. Second, uh, we need to encourage our students to reflect upon the uh, anthropological ethical code, but also to be thinking about other kinds of ethical codes. And hopefully the exercise you're going to do after the class will do this, because I think um, <clears throat> for many of you, if you really take seriously the anthropological ethical code, you'll find that in some cases it violates what your own gut instinct, which is to say your cultural background, suggests the ethical response should be. We want to encourage dialogue with colleagues on ethical issues, and I am, in fact, encouraging you guys to have uh, dialogues on ethical issues in the uh, assignment on Friday, the group assignment. And we are supposed to discourage participation in ethically questionable projects, and hopefully uh, I'm successful at that as well. Anthropologists are supposed to give credit where credit is due. This means publicly acknowledging student and trainee assistance in our research, giving appropriate credit for co-authorship to students and trainees, encouraging publication of worthy student trainee papers, and compensating students and trainees to justify for their participation in professional activities. And many of the faculty that I work with include, uh, have co-authored papers with students. And in some cases, we have given credit to students who assisted us with research in our acknowledgments. Um, I've done that on several occasions. And one of the papers that you read here, Abu Hashish and Peterson, is actually uh, research that was done with a graduate student. Uh, and we're co we, we co-published uh, the paper together um, after she finished her uh, master's thesis. And finally, no sex. Teachers have to be aware of the exploitation and serious conflicts of interest that can result if they engage in sexual relations with students and trainees. And teachers are expected to avoid sexual liaisons with people for whose educational and professional training they are in any way responsible. In other words, one of the problems isn't just the risk that professors and students will trade sex for grades, although those kinds of scandals have happened uh, at universities in the past, but also that professors should seek to exclude any kind of even a possibility of that. So anyone who you are engaged in a uh, sexual relationship with should not be taking classes from you, you should not be responsible for their training, you should not be responsible for writing them letters of recommendation, you should not be responsible for any of their mentorship. If you are, you should not be engaged in that kind of relationship. Um, teaching precludes sexual liaisons in the anthropological uh, ethics state. There are some special ethical issues that arise when we get to applied anthropology. The effort to put anthropological knowledge and anthropological perspectives to work in solving the world's problems. Applied anthropologists, as with any other anthropologists, have to be alert to the danger of compromising their anthropological ethics as a condition for engaging in research and practice. It often happens that anthropologists are working in the private sector. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, did a project for uh, one of the big pizza chains and he said it was absolutely amazing research. That they, they gave them so much money that they could do a far more detailed, multi-city study than they ever could have done with a government grant. And they were really pleased with the results and with their final report. And they would have liked to have published it. But there they ran into a problem. The company that hired them considers it to be proprietary data. They're not allowed to publish. And so their research work for this corporation is in violation with one of the ethical principles. Now, it's not one of the 
high priority ethical principles like do no harm, um, but there's still a violation. And one of the things that, but there's still a violation. And one of the things that anthropologists working with corporations have to continually do is think about whether or not what they're doing is ethically important or not. And the, the feeling that my colleague had was that publication of this information would benefit him because it was a very interesting study, but he wasn't harming the profession or anyone else by not publishing since it had no real critical or important theoretical value. It gets even more complicated when the applied anthropologists are working for government, government agencies, policy agencies, or the United States military or some other military, uh, all of which can have direct, dramatic, life and death consequences for some of the people that they're studying. And indeed, uh, there, we'll talk more about this later in the semester, but there was a period when it was very much in vogue for anthropologists to join the military and uh, work in Afghanistan and Iraq in helping the U.S. military understand the people um, in whose country they were engaged in peacekeeping. But gradually, anthropologists began to worry that the data they produced could be used by the military not just for the peacekeeping mission to protect, but it could also be used to target. And there were some widely publicized cases, and anthropologists began to stop joining these teams. And as the teams couldn't get anthropologists, began replacing them with other kinds of political scientists who did not have the same kinds of specialized uh, language skills and intercultural training. The effectiveness of these human terrain teams declined, and they've started to phase them out. In sum, ethics is a crucial problem for any kind of social scientist. Human beings studying human beings have ethical obligations to those human beings. Ethics ceases to be a philosophical question and becomes a serious question of everyday engagements with the people that you're studying and figuring out what is the fairest way to treat them what is the best way to treat them, and how do I deal with ethical problems that I did not anticipate that nonetheless arise in the fieldwork. What we're going to do now is I'm going to give you a series of case studies, all of which are true, and you're going to do this for homework and bring it to class, and we will have some interesting discussions.